to the cloud. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Murmurations in the studio with eco artist Susan Hostetler. <laughs> so exciting to have uh, Susan here. Her work is so inspiring and especially meaningful as we celebrate Earth Month. It's not just Earth Day, but we celebrate Earth Month, nature inspired art. Um, we have another eco artist. Uh, here with us, um, SSTCI board member Neha Misra is here, and a shout out to artist Marcy Wolf Hubbard, um, who uh, put me in touch with Susan a while ago because I was <laughs> looking for someone specifically that that merges art and and the environment. And um, and before we get started, I I wanted to tell you about a few other things we have coming up as we celebrate Earth Month. I mentioned Marcy is here; she is hosting a special um, uh, art exhibition, a virtual art exhibition called Naturally or Nature Ally, a virtual community art exhibition in celebration of Earth Day on Earth Day, Friday, February, sorry, April 22nd at 7 p.m. on Zoom. So you can send Marcy at Marcy Plus Art, we'll put it in the chat, send her your work uh, up, up to, uh, did we say like three pieces, four pieces, one to four pieces, and then we will show it. It's really fun. Marcy leads a lot of these virtual art exhibitions and it's really fun, but you're also welcome to join us even if you're not contributing as an artist. Um, we also have um, comedy returning, a comedy trio, um, not, not with Earth Day, but on the 20th is uh, Wednesday the 20th, we have uh, Spring Fling, hosted by Ch uh, Chip Jones. Lots of great comics lined up for that. And then for all of our artists out there, whether artists of all stripes, musicians, visual artists, poets, filmmakers, we encourage you to join us for our quarterly art salon. So this spring art salon, we encourage you especially to, sell, to share work that is um, celebrating nature it would be great, but all, all of your work would be interesting to share with us. Um, and then on the, um, not related to Earth Day, but on April, Thursday, April 28th, we have um, From Victimhood to Aggression, Russia's Path to War with Ukraine with Gulnaz Sharafuti Denova, PhD, author of The Red Mirror, Putin's Leadership and Russia's Insecure Identity. We've had her before. She's a very interesting um, uh, academic on on the whole Putin Russia uh, situation, and she's from that region of the world, and um, and she she should have an interesting follow up as as we are now looking at the war with Ukraine. Uh, so that's on Zoom on Thursday, April twenty eighth. We're doing all Zoom programs until. Um, May, in May, we're starting back in person, but only for outdoor events. So we'll be back with our Twilight Tuesdays. And then we also are bringing our Silver Spring Blues Festival back. It's our 13th year. That's always the Saturday before Father's Day. So June 18th is our Silver Spring Blues Festival. And we have a variety of events all week uh, for about 10 days leading up to the festival from June 8th through the 18th is Silver Spring Blues Week. So mark your calendars. All of our events are made possible with generous support from Montgomery County, United Therapeutics, the Arts and Humanities of Montgomery County, Maryland State Arts, Montgomery College, and many others. And now let's get to the program. Um, I actually personally was already familiar with Susan's work. I just didn't know her yet. And, and I paid attention to the work itself, but I don't always look at the names, especially if I'm out of the... Montgomery County area. I, I'm a patient at Char. Um, oh, wow. At Char, I'm a breast cancer patient at oh um, Inova Char Cancer Center. And oh. I actually love going there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I love going there. And in part, it's because of the, um, it's a wonderful space, really, right, Susan? It's, oh, um, yeah. oh, that really warms my heart that you say that. That's the whole point is that people yeah. get that feeling. Yes. So, yeah. So, you know, you're always afraid to go to your oncologist. And, but I always look at the bright side that I'm only stage one and I have 
I have a good prognosis, but I still have to go regularly and I enjoy what they have, the installations they have there, including your murmurations, all the birds. Yeah. And I have to, I think you have a few other um, outdoor things there too, right? You said? Uh, no, Somewhere not right? there. No oh, outdoor okay. things there, but that's that's the big one. <laughs> well, I have to go and take a photo. Next time I'm there, I'm going to go take a photo in front of it. So do that. <laughs> well, well, Susan Hostetler is an eco artist influenced by travels in nature. After earning her fine arts degree in painting, she started her overseas travel setting up a hand paint, hand paper making mill in Friedberg, Germany in 1985. And her work in Germany led to exhibitions at the Gutenberg and things for museums. Her move to Barcelona, Spain changed her palette and imagery due to the light fauna and flora of the Mediterranean regions. Whether working in gouache uh, and mixed media on handmade paper, or working three-dimensionally with clay, Hostetler has always been inspired by nature. From her New York City studio, Hostetler traveled to Africa, Europe, and the South Pacific, gathering further, further inspiration for her works. Um, Hostetler's work hangs in permanent collections, including large multi-panel site-specific commissions for the Federal Reserve Bank, which is right near where I live. I can see it from my window <laughs> in Foggy Bottom here, as well as special commissions for the Innova Shar Cancer Center, U.S. Committee for a Unifem, Four Seasons Hotel, Deutsche Bank, Dun & Bradstreet, Reader's Digest, Fidelity Corporation, and several others. Very impressive. Selected for the Arts and Embassies program by the U.S. State Department. Um, she was also chosen by the Smithsonian Institute for, for its site traveling exhibition. Hostetler added hand paper making as a skill and awards from the Russell Siebert and Tiffany Foundations to study with Twin Rocker Handmade Paper in India, Indiana, where she made custom papers for artists, including Robert Rauschenberg, Andy Warhol, and Jasper Johns. As an art educator, Hostetler has worked in Washington, D.C. museums and schools. She was honored with the Robert Rauschenberg Power of the Arts Award for Innovation in Teaching Art to Students with Learning Challenges in 2012. Still active in the D.C. Art Education Chapter of the National Art Education Association, Hostetler was a member of the first executive board 2012 through 2014. Susan Hostetler exhibits both nationally and internationally. Her works have been featured in the film You've Got Mail, the TV series Beverly Hills 90210, and in publications including the Washington Post, Boston Globe Magazine, Metro Life Magazine, Washington Post, um, Frankfurter, uh, Runchau, and the New York Hotelier. Hostetler's studio is in Washington, DC. Welcome, Susan Hostetler. <laughs> what an I, I should have Fire. given you the shortened version. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting Sorry. to see all the different connections and it's wonderful. It's a, and I know, um, I know folks are eager to hear your own story. So I'll turn it over to you to, to, to start us with the PowerPoint. And you're, you said you welcome um, questions along the way as you go. Yeah, that might okay. be easier instead of at the Great. end. Yeah. Great. And we might have a few at the end too, but, and you can put questions as well in the chat. Um, but um, yeah, along the way is great too. So, okay, Susan, take it away. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Lisa. Well, that was uh, quite an introduction. Um, so I don't have to say much because it's just going to be repetitive, but um, it's um, tonight I'm going to go through some uh, images that show uh, an arc of my uh, what I've done in my career in the last decades. And um, as Lisa said, the natural world is my muse and I work in both two dimensional and three dimensional, although three dimensional is very recent to me, like in the last eight years, actually. Um, in my 20s and 30s, I traveled a lot. And uh, when it, wherever I went, I would paint whatever I saw in terms of fauna and flora. And um, the uh, even after my husband and I, who, he's from the South Pacific, even after we had kids, we, we traveled often as well. So I'm beginning here with the first slide that's up. 
and she, uh, Lisa mentioned Twin Rocker. And I, I started with this slide tonight because it was my first true uh, real art job. And um, it was uh, really an incredible experience. And um, on the left in the red scarf is uh, Kathy Clark, who may even be on the, on the, the Zoom tonight. And she uh, is one of the um, founders of Twin Rocker handmade paper. And um, the, um, uh, uh oh, it's not working. You know how we had that problem before? Sorry, everybody. Um, Go ahead and stop your screen share and then restart it. I think okay. that might help. All right, so let me, yeah, it's your, your screen sharing. So pause share. No, no, stop it. Stop the share. Stop it. Okay. Do you want me oh. to stop it for you? Now, now that's moving to the next one. Is that okay, everybody? Can you see the next slide? No, we don't see it now. Okay. All right. Okay. I just stopped your screen share. So go ahead and try the screen share again. I think that'll work. All right. Hmm. And if that doesn't work, I have it on my computer. You have it, and it might work better because I keep okay. having this problem with this. Uh... Okay. Let me try to get. I can't even at this point get back to the. Um... Okay. Okay. Do you want me to share it? Ah, uh, here we go. Now I'm. Let, it? Uh, let me just try this again. I'll go back to the beginning here and. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm gonna to try to screen share again and bring up the PowerPoint again. Okay, can everybody see the PowerPoint now? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay, so I, I think if I put it on play, let's see if it'll, it'll work if it doesn't. All right, so here we are uh, uh, dipping a sheet of paper and it, it's kind of a choreography working together to get the right rhythm to, to get uh, a sheet of paper. Um, the next slide, besides learning uh, how to make uh, professional uh, traditional paper, um, we also uh, learned uh, pulp painting because it was a very popular technique at that time. And this is one of my pieces where lots of layers of pulp and maybe a lot of you artists and art teachers have worked with pulp before, some embedded um, you know, uh, collage pieces as well. And then I would always draw on top uh, after the piece was dry. And you'll see throughout that my work um, has components of abstraction and representation. And I never thought about it much, but that has been one thing that has followed uh, me throughout all of my work. And even now I have still a balance of abstraction in the piece along with a representational image. Um, this is, uh, you know, I say that wherever I traveled, I would uh, paint whatever I saw. And while I worked at Twin Rocker, I didn't really travel very much. So cows were my muse then, and they were my subject matter, did a lot of these. Um, and this is, uh, uh, again, the abstraction with the representation. And this we're jumping now. Um, after working at Twin Marker for a few years, I set out to Europe, uh, specifically Germany, to visit some friends. And the visit turned into four years, in which time we started a paper mill there, which you had read about, or talked about, Lisa. And um, we made paper much the same way that we did at Twin Rocker for artists, printmakers, bookmakers. And we even had a booth for a few years in a row at the um, uh, Frankfurt book, book Fair. And um, the one, the image on the uh, right with the little girl is uh, my inspiration from Germany, from all the forests there. And then on the left, you can guess, that's uh, when I moved to Barcelona after Germany. And I was in Barcelona for about four years as well. And this series was uh, Street Cats. 
I did one on street dogs too. And um, in the upper portion of uh, the painting, there are, um, that's inspired from uh, Park Gui in Barcelona, which was one of the masterpieces of uh, Antoni Gaudí. And, you know, if anybody has seen it, it's the broken plates that are all put together. It's an absolutely magnificent part sculpture. And in fact, Julian Schnabel's inspiration, of, you know, his first broken plate series came from uh, Gaudi as well. Um, so the next slide is um, also an, an example of using paper pulp um, as a background, if you will. And then the camel is integrated into on, on top of that using gouache and pencil. Um, and this was from a trip to Morocco. Uh, the wolf series, I did uh, uh, about 40 wolves and same technique with the background being the handmade paper pulp and some embedments and then drawing on top of that. And that was from a trip to Alaska. Um, then my next big move came, uh, I, left, um, I left Spain uh, after wandering around to Alaska, California and, and Arizona. And then I settled on, yep, I'm gonna move to New York City. And uh, I got my studio and I started to paint again on oil, uh, oil with oil on canvas and started to abstract my work, which was really exciting to me you know, getting, I don't know why artists always do this, you know, they want to get away from whatever they're doing to attempt to do something more. Anyway, so I was going toward abstraction. And um, then the next thing that happened was, let's see if I can, oh, why did it stop again? It stopped. Can you hear that little pinging noise? Anyway, I hear that you're trying to get it. Yeah, so I'm gonna have to. What if you put your cursor in the upper right center area? Does it give you the option see, to click? On? I can't even see the cursor. It's, oh, oh, okay. Now, okay. All right. We'll just we'll just go along with this. It's so this is okay. Slide. <laughs> and um, so this is wait. Yeah. So I was painting in New York. I was doing the abstractions, and then the next thing that came along. Uh, were children, and it was a little bit of a surprise. So we had two children back to back, <laughs> 16 months apart. So house was, you know, more um, full and chaotic. And so I had to, to pull back and have something that was very concrete. So I went very representational. And also because of time, um, I couldn't paint large. And so I did, all these are about eight and a half by 11. And so I just, that's when I went back to, to, to Flora and I did this series for years uh, called tree adornments. So it was anything that can grow on a tree. And um, let's see here, if I can get, this says, these are not quite so small. These are about 20 by 20, but again, the same you know, thing of repeating uh, an image and then putting it together in groups. And, and again, you can see that I, I have a chosen uh, focal point, uh, a thistle or whatever it might be, but surrounding that uh, central image are lots of abstractions. I call it my new age botanicals because you know how botanicals have those little the stamen and pistil and petals and these were all just abstract marks surrounding these. Um, this is another, another example. And then, what came next? So I put them together in groups of four to 20. Now, this is another big leap of, of many years here to bring, bring you up to, this is about eight years ago. I moved to Washington DC and um, I guess I started these in my studio on 411 New York Avenue, which is just, just by Union Market. And so the first birds I ever did were on the left. And and I wasn't really thinking about doing a series on birds. I was thinking about working three-dimensionally. And so the bird just seemed like the right size, the right shape, simple form. And I, in that particular one, I 
I used a mixture of marble dust and plaster and clay. So, so I didn't really have the option to be very detailed. And after they were dry, I just wrapped them with, uh, with strips of old drawings and then put them in a box with my drawings. And same on the right-hand side, these are a little with clay. So these are a little bit more able to form them. And again, you know, in a box with, with drawings. And the patina on those are, it's, it's a powdered graphite that I just like rubbed and rubbed into the, to the surface. Um, and let's see what's next. You know, people always have, have asked me because of, you know, doing birds for nearly a decade, um, you know, why, why birds? And I, I believe that humans need a connection to wildlife. And as urban dwellers, well, a lot of us are urban dwellers here. Um, the most immediate source are birds. You know, they're everywhere. They're quite often just right out your front door. So um, I think that, that that connection is important for us. And, um, you know, they can fly. They have a connection between sky and earth. And so that that's in and of itself is fascinating. Um, and I've been focusing, um, as you see, well, we're, we're moving along here. Let's get to the next slide. This is in the, in the studio in 411. And we, we had to move out because of the development of Union Market. But this was an open studio day. That's where everything looks all neat and tidy. Um, so the birds, the first birds are on the table on the left, and you can see they're just they're just lying there in boxes and not. And then on the right is one of my first um, little mini murmurations that I put up. And again, the birds are pretty uniform, no no wings. They're just all um, very rudimentary bird shape and form rather. And um, I had intended to get them to fly, but um, on the wall, but people ha also had commented that my first bird seemed very um, mummy-like and that was bothersome to some people. But I actually like that idea of, of, it's like honoring a life really. So didn't bother me, um, but uh, let's see what's next here. This, is, this was a great opportunity. I was so happy to have this show. It was a, a duo show with um, one of my studio mates, Julia Bloom. And uh, this is the Athenaeum, which a lot of you probably know this space. And it was the first time I could do, a, I had this huge wall. I don't know if it's 22, I think it's 22 feet from the floor to the ceiling, but what an opportunity to showcase the murmurations. And, and uh, so that was very exciting. And on the left is one of my drawings. And I really like showing, when I have an exhibition, I like to show both the 2D and the 3D together. Oops, there we go again. I just don't know why that happens. It's just random. Oh, somebody wants to be admitted. Maybe that's it. I let them in. Okay. All right. So let me try to. Hmm. I hope I don't have to stop share again. Oh my uh, gosh, this is weird. That is, yeah, it's just yeah. randomly happens. Uh, well, Lisa, should I stop share again? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to show it or do you want? Well, I, I, it works for me now as soon as I stop sharing, but then of course nobody else can see it. Um, all right, let's try it again. Here we go. So this is the Athenaeum. Can everybody see it or do I have to share it again? No, not yet. Okay, so let me share. Karen French says in the chat, love that you wrapped the birds in your old drawings. I was wondering how you dealt with the surface. Are they fired? Uh, the surface or the actual bird itself? It depends on what clay I'm using. This is, I prefer to use paper clay, which has cellulose in it. So I've experimented with um, firing it and it actually becomes more fragile um, because of the cellulose gets burned out and then it's hollow in those spots. So I prefer to uh, use just air dry cellulose clay 
So it's half cellulose and half clay. Um, all right, I'm trying to trying to get back to sharing. Uh, at least I can't find the, um, it's not allowing me to. Okay. Hang do you on. want me to do it? I'm just going to try it again. Okay, here I've got share okay. screen. Got it. Yeah, it's too bad we have to keep repeating this. And now, can you see it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're sharing and you can see where what I'm doing, right? Okay, so we were at, we were here at the Athenaeum and then um, this is the drawing that was on the left. And um, this is, uh, I use a uh, stent, I create my own stencils, I cut my own stencils. So the, although in my drawings in this one, I'm still interested in flight and migrations, a lot of my work is concerning the pattern of bird songs. So this is my interpretation of the visual score of bird song. And um, I use, uh, a little bit of gouache, but mostly graphite on, on mylar. And I like the mylar because I can paint on both sides and it has that translucency. And the graphite uh, is very slippery on the mylar and you know can smear and mush around, which is, is something that I like too. Um, and I decided to use, you see, you've seen my drawings from earlier and um, the, the arc from representation to less representation. And by using the stencil of the bird, um, I'm able to get away from needing to do something representational. You know, it becomes more a flat sort of, it denotes bird, if you will. All right, Lisa, there we go. Okay, though this is a detail of uh, the uh, murmuration on the wall. And you can see here that they're starting to sprout wings. And this is an exhibition at uh, the Kramer Gallery in Silver Spring. And it was a three person show. Beverly Ress had work in here as well. And in the foreground there, you can see Dahlia Lutvak's work. And again, it's always uh, fun to have a new, a new wall to do. When was that, Susan? It's probably 2017. Yeah, I, I yeah. saw it too. I mean, I work in the Civic Building. Oh, so. okay. yeah. yeah. That was, yeah. That was fun. Um, and this is another exhibition space that I love. This is Brentwood Arts Exchange. And this was another three-person show with uh, Sharon Fischel, who does the paintings. A lot of you probably know both these people and um, Nancy Saucer, who does the ceramics. And uh, they both work at McLean Project for the Arts and that's where they are tonight at the spring openings. <laughs> and um, on the, the right-hand side, um, you can see that flock rising up. And I um, to capture that spectacle of flock rising up or of murmurations, um, I wanted to create a multi-dimensional movement to the installation. So I drew directly onto the wall. And this is a little bit, uh, this is a close up of it. And you can see it really feels like they're moving, like they really have just risen up. And I, I start by putting a, a wash of graphite onto, directly onto the wall in varying shades. And then um, I have these uh, decals that I've made from drawings that I've done. And there's a picture uh, that might show it. Uh, yeah, this is a detail. So you can see those um, birds are, they're stencils that I cut out from old drawings and then I use those as a decal. And then at the top, you can see there's a, a 3D bird. And then the important final uh, aspect is to have lighting. And so that, there, that you have some, some shadow from the birds and that creates another layer of flutter. And this is um, from, uh, this, is, this used to be Grace, it's now Tefra. 
And Grace, well, Tefra now, they, they still maintain this gallery called Signature, um, which is a couple blocks from the Tefra main gallery. And I, this was exciting too, because of the length of the hallway and also different te wall texture and different color. And um, again, able to show my two dimensional drawings as well here. And this was my first residential installation. And it's in uh, Rockport, Massachusetts. And, um, you know, it's, it's always a challenge uh, to put the, the flock, to adapt the flock to whatever architectural elements are, are there, wherever the client wants the work. And um, I always say, you know, birds can fly anywhere. And this is the hospital, the, the one that Lisa was talking about. This is the relatively new Shar Cancer Institute at Inova. And as, as I said before, I mean, to be given this opportunity, when you have your mind full of murmurations and how, to, how bird flocks fly and you look up in the sky and you see you know, all these acrobatics and it, to be able to have 75 feet to, to put your flocks into is just such a gift. And also the fact that it's in the cancer center, that was very special to me too, that it could be in the cancer center. And so, um, yes. Oh, were you involved with the, um, the video of Mur Murmuration's video that they also had in the main lobby? No. Oh, I got to see that. I didn't yeah, know. So they have a lot of video uh, projected onto the wall. It's really, you know, high tech and it's all animals. Like sometimes they have like, Buffalo, which I love, bison, oh, cool. um, just oh. footage from uh, Yellowstone, I think. Um, but then they also had mur murmurations before. Oh, well, um, they're just mir mirroring my murmurations, I think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> something, yeah. something fascinating to, to look at. Um, right. Life imitating art. Yeah. Life imitating life. <laughs> circle. Great. So, um, this, let's see, next one is, this is a close up. And I was thinking about, um, because there were so many birds involved, I, I didn't know if my, my hands, my fingers could, could make it. And so this is when I started to make some uh, uh, molds and play around with plaster and, and hydrocol and all these things. But there were so many different problems involved with the, with the, the mold making and, I just ended up making them all individual. And you can see how different each one is. And that's what creates the movement. And so I, st I still think that's very important. And do you, do you examine birds, birds up close? Like, do you get uh, stuffed, you know, um, taxidermy? Yeah. That's actually a, a really interesting question. I mean, I, I study them in my backyard, and especially during COVID lockdown, I think a lot of people got into birding and, and bird feeder life. <laughs> and um, so in that regard, a lot of bird bodies I saw, but um, also I used to go on these retreats to um, Echo Hill uh, Park, which I think a lot of school kids in Montgomery County go to. It's out across the bay. And um, they had drawers with taxidermed little songbirds. It was absolutely incredible. And one of them had a tag on its, its um, foot that was like 1936. So I don't know how those are surviving in those drawers with all those kids around, but I don't know if they're still there, but that was like about five years ago I was there. And so I could really look at them up close. Uh, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember it, it just brings to mind like studying movement of animals until yeah. the invention of photography, uh, artists could not depict the leg movement of horses. Yeah. So, yeah. And I wondered if that pertained to the flight of birds as well. Um, yeah, so I learned about that at an exhibition at um, um, Phillips, the Phillips collection a few oh, years ago. okay. Yeah, I mean, and there are lots of, really cool videos about birds in flight, like the fact that owls make no sound at all when they fly, it's, it's just really. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this was back to, I got to, uh, yeah, on my resume, I can now say I can uh, manage a scissor lift. It was 
pretty daunting, but I, I managed. I now I can do scissor lift. <laughs> so that's a pano version of of the scissor lift. And um, these are just one of my tables in the studio with uh, the birds ready to to go. They they whites and blues and and sort of golds uh, are were the colors I used. Taupe, I guess. And this is another ex uh, another installation, a permanent one. I was working with this group called the Commission Project, and um, in in New York, and they had a building, uh, this condo building, where the architect wanted to bring the indoor and the outdoor together, have them merge. So you can see in the lower left corner, there's. Um, uh, it's a garden and it's pretty big and open to the sky. And then uh, on this lower level, it's uh, of the interior surrounded by glass or it's glass interior. So the birds were a, a good, good fit for that. And this is a similar situation where um, they wanted a long corridor with birds. And um, it was interesting because the art consultant, when we were talking about this job, she said, oh, do you know about flock theory? And I, I said, well, of course I do. I, I put flocks together. I'm sure I can put a theory together too. But what she meant was, if you look at the bottom, I put this in the uh, um, name, the, the, the plaque, um, which I did not write. But at the bottom, the last sentence says that various aspects of her composition speak to the core components of flock theory, including separation, velocity, alignment, and cohesion. And those core components are corporate components, not artist bird components. So, but I found that those four tenants actually uh, al align with what I do with my flocks, separation, velocity, alignment, and cohesion. So it worked. And this is uh, an image close up. I did the gouache or the graphite wash on this piece and also the decal and then the 3D birds too. And this is uh, another very special, um, very special installation for me. This is in this is the new building for the American Physical Therapy Association, and their motto is "Move to Soar." And so I was very pleased to be offered this commission as well, and uh, I named it "Move to Soar." Um, and I also got to use a scissor lift on this one. I thought I'd put that in. And uh, let's see. So the next slide, I'm moving on now to um, showing various methods and materials that I used to showcase the birds. So I, uh, this was in a Washington Sculpture Group show, uh, a long shelf with the birds piled on top of the shelf. And something that um, I think Neha said when we were talking er earlier before we, we started um, about uh, painting and thinking about uh, painting fauna and flora and connecting that with the climate crisis and what's happening to the demise of, of our populations. And since I've been painting fauna and flora for so many years, I have to, I never thought about that when I was first painting them, I just, and I now, I always think about it. I always think about the, the populations that are, you know, in decline and Audubon posted, I think a couple of years ago that in the last 40 years, it's been 3 billion birds lost. So it's just, it's, it's at such an accelerating pace that it's hard to uh, ignore. And let's see. This is another iteration of, of showcasing birds. In this case, they're suspended from a uh, laser cut piece of metal. Um, and this was also a Washington Sculpture Group show and it was meant to be in 2020 called Fleeting Fled and we couldn't do it then of course because of COVID. And so then we opened it in 2021 and I actually think it was more appropriate at that time, even than in 2020, before we knew. Um, and these were arranged on the floor of the gallery. This was at Stone Tower at Glen Echo. 
And um, this is another medium I've been using, mesh wire. And uh, making the birds transparent like this um, makes them feel ghost-like and kind of skeletal and, and really just like a shell, maybe a shell after death, like a you know, snake skin or something. This is a porcelain cast bird. So I uh, had a mold made and then I do the slip slip casting, they call it, yeah. And um, these are fired. And then glass, I just, I love glass, but it's so hard for me to find um, a glass artist who will cast the glass. So if anybody knows of somebody, let me know. I've worked with a couple uh, artists from uh, Washington Glass School. And it seems most artists, glass artists do fused glass or um, blown glass. So it's really hard to find somebody who will do this. And once they do it, they just say it's too much work, but they just what, look so- What cool. kind of glass is it? It's cast glass. Cast. So it's okay. a, you know, a mold made from my birds and then have, it's like the lost wax process. And it's just a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why they don't do it anymore. Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, so um, that's ongoing. And then this is a series I started a few years ago um, called Interspecies Communication. And it was prompted a little bit by the backyard banter going on during, during the lockdown, watching the bird feeder. But also it seemed to parallel um, the situation that our world is in, our country is in, and just the um, problems with communication. So I'm, I'm delving into that with these uh, drawings. And, and now, now it's stopping again. <laughs> Jeez, I'm almost it, at the end. I only have. It looks three like more it's slides. related to someone popping into the waiting room to be let in. That's when it I seems it to is, happen. It is related to that. So if you can let them in, but I still have yeah. to. To um, so you answer. can you can go to the left column and just select it there. Yeah. I think this might work. Okay, no, uh -huh. didn't. I have to actually stop. Okay, I have to actually, I tried to do a new share, but they're not allowing me. Okay, so here I go. Bye. <laughs> All right. I wonder yeah. if you can push escape. Yeah, I can't push escape either. When it gets like that, it freezes up the laptop. Okay, can you see it again? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, let's hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> I know, it's still happening. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, just there. there. I'm just going to do yeah. it, man. Oh, that's what you just said, Lisa. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I was okay. So again, crow conversation. Um, and those are the interspecies communications. And then my the, another series I'm working on is using my stencils, my um, mar the little marks, and trying to um, uh, evoke murmurations just through the abstractions without using the birds. Although the bird's image is still here, it's more about that movement from, from those abstract marks. And then the last one <laughs> is, this is the, from that same series too. And again, a couple birds are in there, but they're more camouflaged, I feel. That's what I'm working on. And lastly is my studio. Um, I have, you know, birds always on that wall, just waiting to, to fly into, um, you know, another formation or something and just have some of my drawings hanging up there too. Um, uh, a lot of times people ask me, aren't you ready for a change from birds? And I have to say that over the last couple of years, I have been thinking a lot about foxes. I have done foxes in the past too, but I might revisit that. But really, I'm I'm not. I'm just not. It to me, it seems like birds. It's just endless information and fascination. I feel like I've just tapped the surface. There's so much to know about bird behavior, and and all aspects of avian life. So I'm I'm still I'm sticking with them. And, and, um, and across cultures, birds have so much symbolism, you know, of our spirit and the other, you know, 
the unknown and the other side. Exactly. Yeah. And each individual bird has a different meaning and a different spiritual presence too. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. there's just so much. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, and I, I know basically the presence of my, my, flocks my birds the murmurations it's it's meant to be uplifting as as i think they are the birds are but um alternatively i just can't ignore you know what's happening now and and it speaks as you can see from some of those pieces speaks to the decline of our bird populations but i hope i can have an impact either in showcasing the beauty and the connection that birds have to each other and to us, and also the necessity of birds in our life. So thank you, everyone. Great. Uh, take thank any you. Antonia is just asking, would you like to ask, ask Susan yourself what you just wrote? Oh, sure. Hi, Susan. Hi. Um, long time no see. I saw your talk on Facebook and I just had to join, but, and I've, and I've always loved your birds. So yeah. I just want to know what your favorite species of birds is, if you had to choose one. Oh gosh. Oh, that is so hard. But I, I just will tell you, I happen to have, you know, for each sun, I have a bird that is the embodiment of each sun. I don't ask me how I arrived at that exactly. But the first one is the great white egret. And the second one is the owl, and I haven't decided which owl yet. So that, those are probably my favorites in a way, but I like song songbirds. I love songbirds. So it's good to see you. <laughs> see you too. Great. Hey, who else has a question? I just had a question. Or comment. Marcy. Susan, I'm so glad you could do this. <laughs> Thanks. So I um, wanted to know, or you planning to have another open studio? We at, you know, we're at off the beaten track now. Um, we are talking about it. I, we have to coordinate together all the people in the studio and I, it'd be nice to have one in spring if we can get together. We'll see, we'll let everybody know, but we're getting back to, you know, feeling like we can do that. People can wear masks if they want to, kind of like it is right now. Half the people wear masks, half the people don't, so. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, who else has, um, uh, Rebecca wrote to me privately and meant to write to everyone just a moment ago saying, um, birds are miraculous. Uh, they are indeed. I was actually just talking today with my uh, dear friend of mine, um, some of you know on the call, like Karen Brown, um, Diana Enjai, who's a folklorist anthropologist with Smithsonian. And we were talking about the whole symbolism of birds and, and that they may carry spirits. And, you know, even in our, you know, Western, our Western perception and not just in other cultures, but across cultures, there are those theories, um, you know, that they're either sent by our loved ones or embody our loved ones mm -hmm. in spirit form. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I have a question. Neha, please come and join us. Thank you, Lisa and uh, Susan. I uh, want to thank you for sharing your absolutely phenomenal body of work. Thank you for taking us on this journey. Oh, Even you. with those sounds, maybe those sounds are like birds, you know? Like <laughs> the right. sound we're hearing, it is the spirit. No, <laughs> you know, maybe spirit uh, presents itself in its face. So thank <laughs> you so much. And oh, like we were talking, I I just feel such a kinship with uh, this body of work because, and actually I'll I'll put the link here. I just uh, designed this past week. Uh, banner for American bird conservancies. Uh, uh, they, they launched a new climate and justice fellowship. So I'll also drop it in the uh, box here. If anybody is interested, uh, you know, please feel free uh, to, uh, to, to apply and learn more. My question for you, Susan, through all these shif shifting shape and forms of birds that are inhabiting so many healing spaces I see, you know, as you were sharing from galleries to like hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, 
how has like how has your relationship with yourself as an artist you know inhabiting i feel birds like you were talking are between in a way uh, you know sky and earth and i feel they transcend gravity in flight how has your relationship with yourself as an artist evolved through these you know bird movements over last decade as you were sharing oh i don't know quite how to answer that except that i feel like um i guess you know when i was doing fauna and flora and and i did i guess i went from wherever i traveled i would do that animal and then i had that long period of flora when i had children raising children and um i think now i feel just really invested in the birds so i feel really focused that's one thing that's different is the focus it's like just yeah that's mm -hmm. that's what i would say um and and within that focus then there's so many layers to learn so there's never a pause i never have to pause and wonder what i mean there's so many great books my my laptop is stacked on all these great books about birds you know the genius of birds and and uh, it's just endless so i feel like i can just keep going i don't know if that answers your question but thank you okay. you know since i have both of you up um the whole notion of eco artist you you susan is an eco artist and neha is also could be called an eco artist. I know she's a long time environmental activist and an artist who incorporates a lot of nature, including murmurations into her work. Can you talk about what it means to be an eco artist? Because when I first heard, came across eco artists some years ago, I think it was more people who use recycling, you know, recycling materials. There's that. And, but yours is more about the depiction of of nature and both of both of yours can you yeah. talk a little more about that well I, I i was given that name i didn't make it up for myself um when i lived in new york uh somebody who was writing an article for one of the it was called something hotel magazine and they wanted to write an article about um the paintings i was doing because it was all fauna and flora and they called me an echo artist and uh, it just kind of stuck after that. And I, I remember when I got my website redone about I don't know, like maybe four or five years ago and the guy who was helping me, I said, you know, I think I'll just, I don't know about that echo artist. I mean, he goes, oh no, you want to keep that <laughs> because it identifies you as, as, you know, it identifies you. So, so that's, that's how that came for me. And I, and, and I do feel like it, it fits, so. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. And I'll add, uh, Lisa, it's a wonderful question for me. Um, I feel, you know, as a climate activist, I've spent like 20 years across uh, both sides of Atlantic from India to my American life as a first generation immigrant on climate ad advocacy and climate justice issues. And our planet is literally on fire <laughs> you know the recent uh, intergovernmental Pla panel on climate change report came so I, I feel actually we should each inhabit being an eco artist whatever avatar it may take you know uh, whether we are recycling uh, bottles and making art or whether it's just art of life itself so I feel um, claiming and reclaiming how we want to be seen in the world can shift through changing times. And we were talking earlier, you know, as we were starting the event, I, I have, uh, I, I would say it's more about reclaiming because I feel my tradition is deeply rooted in a spiritual ecology aligned with nature. So it is more about returning from separation to our ecological connection. And I also feel as a woman of color and as an activist of color, much of modern uh, environmental movement in the US uh, and to the extent that white dominant systems impact environmentalism around the world, it's rooted in, in the separation of mother earth. You know, we have to save her because she's out there, but we are part of it, you know, and uh, birds and foxes. That's why I loved what you were sharing, Susan. They are, uh, 
we are we are part of an ecosystem. So I feel, uh, to me, I feel I am eco, and I wish more of us can claim eco than like those ecologists, those environmentalists. <laughs> Thank you for asking that. Such a beautiful great. Neha, that's a great explanation and a great reminder. It's it's about returning to something that was long practiced, regardless of what um, tradition, you know, or group we come from. I think uh, getting back in tune with nature and our spiritual um, foundations, maybe from our ancestors. Um, are there other? I know there are several. Um, artists in the in in our Zoom right now. Are there others who identify as eco artists here? Just I know there are several artists here. So, um, or if you don't want to come on, you can please put. If you're an artist of any kind, please put your website in the chat too, so we can share. Um, I think it's great too that you are your work is exhibited in so many corporate settings and so you're bringing it front and center to people that you know i mean those of us who work in nonprofit or arts sector or environmental kind of work are are thinking often about our environment and the climate uh crisis but it's it's so great just as a comment that your work is kind of gently reminding them of the nature and the um yeah thanks that's kind yeah. of that's uh, yeah it is gently it is gentle it's not i mean i don't i like art that is right in your face too uh, about mm -hmm. a point um uh, but i kind of, this is what i i want to do is just to have the beauty first the beauty brings you in and then you're thinking oh we're about to lose that beauty maybe so yeah that's my mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, it makes us think of, I mean, when was it? Not too long, a couple of years ago, birds were falling falling from the sky. They didn't know exactly what was causing it. It was some kind of pollution in various regions of the world. Mm -hmm. So um, Marcy is saying, I wasn't thinking eco-artists, but do a lot of upcycling and repurposing. Do you do, you do that too, Susan? Upcycling, repurposing type of work? Not really. I just no I no I don't really have that mindset with my artwork um and, just, and you started early on in paper making and then and and doing 2d you know paintings and drawings yeah and then how did you kind of make that jump from from 2d to 3d yeah I just um I, I specifically wanted 2D because it was easier to roll things and travel and move mm -hmm. things and sculpture that had a lot to do with it. And then, um, but when I started with the 3D, um, I just dove right into it that, that, you know, I just wanted to get away from the flat surface and I was trying to build up my surfaces and they were still flat, even though there were 15 layers. And so I thought, well, you're doing it the wrong way. You need to just go straight 3D. And that's why I just chose that mm -hmm. simple, simple form. The right. Mm -hmm. right. Good. Well, we have time for another question or two if somebody here, I, from your paper making days, you mentioned someone was here in the audience. I was hoping to bring them on to chat with you. Oh, yes, so there's a bunch of them here, actually. I have like some, I have some friends here who are from college days. I have college okay, days. Karen. This is Karen Frank. Maybe Karen can say hello. <laughs> you're an art, you're still an artist, Karen. Yeah, she's still an artist. She's got her mute button on. Karen, you're muted. I asked her to unmute so okay. she can hear me now. Oh, okay. she Trying me. to unmute. Yeah, I'm still actively making clay. And that's why I was asking how you're dealing with your surfaces. And I'm doing uh, predominantly wood firings, which is, you know, an atmospheric firing. But, you know, I'm dedicated to the clays and I'm back on the wheel. I haven't really done that since I lived with you, Susan. So that's been kind <laughs> wow. of interesting. <laughs> oh, that's great. No, and I know mm -hmm. you're you retired from teaching so you've got full-time art now yeah yeah but i love that i'm sobbing because i just miss the kids so much i miss that conversation oh you know? yeah 
That's great. Yeah, That's great they were thing. really great. Beautiful presentation, Susan, and I really do love your murmurations and the whole idea of the interaction of them and their, you know, their little lives of, um, you know, that they go about their business without minding us at all. That's right. You know, That's they right. just, you know, <laughs> they're all about their, their own song. Yeah, exactly. And, well put. <laughs> Yeah, and I still have some of the, your paper and, uh, you know, a drawing from the 70s of yours. Oh, wow. Before. So there are some paper makers here, too. So mm -hmm. I don't know if Kathy Clark is still here. I see Janet Hughes. Thank um, you, Karen. Please put a link to your work, Karen, in the chat if you would. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> and we got some Kathy Hughes here. That's my family, Lela Ulu. <laughs> And, um, oh, there's, yeah, there's some friends from the past. That's what happens when you, Susan Miller, that she was my BFF in high school. <laughs> Hi, Susan. Anyway, that's great. so great. Thanks, Is everybody. Is an artist or just an old friend from high school? We just did bad stuff together. No, we didn't. <laughs> <make up. laughs> we great. just had fun. <laughs> um, Great. That's great. Thanks, everybody, for, for checking in. Yeah. And here's one of your family members, you said? Oh, the Leila Ulus are my family. Where are they? They're, they're cutting out now. I bet they're like cut, dropping, dropping, dropping. And my cousin, Nancy and Zane. Oh, and, okay. oh, and Betty Landis. Hi, Betty. Oh, there's Mel, there's Penay. Hi, Penay. <laughs> this is like old home week. <laughs> yeah, it's like a reunion. Where are you coming in, uh, uh, Mel Penay? Uh, Where are you coming in? From the Midwest. Okay, great. Uh, uh, the family in Canada have uh, their computer system just uh, broke down, so they would have been here too, Susan. Uh, oh, no worries. Yeah, yeah. the... We have I wanted to be here. But, yeah, uh, we have relatives in in uh, Canada as well. Uh, Panay's sister and and great. there's my husband, my son. You know. Wow, <laughs> you're so well loved here. And system. you have new fans as well, myself included. So Karen Brown also is an artist and art cur art art curator. You may know Karen Brown. Yeah. So please elaborate in the chat. Yeah, on your installation process. Um, elaborate. Uh, so uh, when I make the bird, I trace every bird and make a paper stencil of it. And then I use those paper stencils as my sketch uh, when I go into the, the location. And that's so that I don't, you know, randomly just drill in the wrong spot. So I, I put the, I call it the sketch. I put the flock up in paper first and then move it around a lot and then drill where, you know, the, where I think the sketch should be. And then the birds go in. Does that answer your question, Karen? Um, it's Karen, it was Karen French's question. No, uh, oh, maybe it wasn't Karen. Oh, Brown, Karen Brown. Yeah, Karen Brown's asking about your mounting oh. of, of murmuration and other works like that. Is it on a pin and what is it? No, made so this is one of the wrapped birds. Okay, so it each bird ha it has a nail drilled and embedded into it. And then this is, and I, I prefer the bird to stand out from the wall because of the shadow play. Um, if I, I've tried it with hooks and stuff, so you can just hook it up. But um, yeah, I just don't think it looks as good. So that's what I use. Oh, and then I imagine you also look for um, how the light is affecting the, the space, the installation yeah. space. Yeah. So it should have a uh, changing light maybe across from it or how, how does it, how should it factor in? Well, it doesn't matter. I mean, if I if it's in a gallery, I can I can do you know galleries can do pretty much what they want in terms of changing the spotlight. But for example, at Anova at Shark Cancer Center, I was concerned about that because I it's it's just skylights, and then they have this sort of low I don't even know what kind of light it is that's on the top uh, of the wall, and I thought oh we're gonna have to put up spotlights. But I actually like the way it is. It's a very soft. If you go in next time you go, it's a very soft 
shadow. It's not a harsh shadow. And I thought that was actually well suited for the space. You want to tell folks exactly where it is in Shar? So if you walk in, anybody can walk in and go downstairs and see it. So they have art all over the building. It's a fabulous mm -hmm. art collection. You can go upstairs and look at the art. There's art on the main floor. So you walk past the lobby and or there's a person there who will direct you and just go straight back to the elevators. And it's like going back and then a little bit to your uh, left and go down one floor and it's on that, the next floor down. Yeah. Great. So I see we have a, a hand just went up and I don't know who it was. Go ahead and start talking if you have a question. Oh, it's me again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's so many birds and they're always bird questions. Susan, one more thing that I loved in your presentation was what you were sharing about so many materials, uh, both over course of your creative uh, practice, but also within birds. So my question is, do you have any dream materials you haven't like uh, played with yet that you would like to play with in the future? Uh, mm -hmm. As, as you make more birds? That's a really good question. I want to solve this glass problem. That's, mm -hmm. that's my real my real thing. I, I love the way it looks. We're having trouble with the attachment. I'm having trouble finding somebody who wants to put the work into making cast glass. They just don't want to do it. It's too much work, except for artists who make their own work in cast glass. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I just want to perfect that and get it get it up and running. And then after that, I'm, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm up for any any uh, options. Um, anybody who suggests something to me. Have you tried um, working with polyester resin or cast acrylic? Oh, good. Whoever said that? Yes, I have. One of the glass artists I worked with. We. Oh, there's Zane. Anyway, <laughs> Nancy was here until right when I hit. <laughs> the, so, the um, video, so you missed Nancy, sorry. Oh, that's okay. So Zane, um, one of the glass artists who did um, the, you know, cast the glass for me, um, we, I asked her to do one because she was talking to me about that and she did do one uh, out of uh, resin and, and I liked it. I like glass better, but I liked it a lot too. It was beautiful. And same kind of translucency, transparency at different points. Um, we, we didn't go forward with that because I didn't get the commission. It was some, some commission that fell through, but you know how that goes. <laughs> well, one thing about the cast resins is that the uh, um, stem could come from the hole that you pour the resin through. So when you took it off, it was all could be possibly one piece with the stem made into it. So make the mold so that when you pour it, the stem exists and that could Yeah, if you use like a straw into the mold and then pour the straw all the way full, and then when it hardens, take off the straw and the mold and it's all one piece, and you wouldn't have to put, um, then you wouldn't have to, to add yeah. another yeah. mounting attachment. Yeah, that's, that's the problem. We found that the glass is so heavy, can't have it extend that far from the wall on a tiny little yeah it's just we got to work that out but yeah that's that's remaking the molds which i think would be the way to go and Karen uh, brown suggests working with some glass artists at penland uh is it penland school of Cra art crafts in north carolina. north carolina north carolina yeah that that's thank you i i would rather be lo more local <laughs> um because it's just easier you know to be local uh but but i could write i could write write to them yes okay great she says their glass studio is wonderful i think mm -hmm. maybe the washington area glass guild is it what it's called they must have someone who does cast glass well the washington studio school i i've 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 communicated with them enough. And I'm, I have talked to people at, you know, Glen Echo has a glass studio. Nobody there does cast, but somebody said, one of them said, oh, I, I could give it a go though. So, and then there are some glass artists out at the workhouse out in Virginia. So 
Mm. That's another option, but also they don't do cast glass. <laughs> it's just, I think it's just become too difficult, but I'll find mm -hmm. somebody, but I appreciate everybody's suggestions. It, it sounds like there's not a medium that you haven't worked with. Oh, yeah, from paper to glass. And I guess I'm sure it's out there. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's fun to, I think a lot of artists like playing around with different, different mediums. Yes, yes, great. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I've come across an artist who works in so many different mediums. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, paper is usually kind of one thing over here, yeah. and I might do painting, but then you're doing sculpture too. Yeah. So great. Um, well, looking back at your life, when did you really become an artist? Were you a child artist, or did it develop later? And what inspired you to take um, this path? I always, you know, played around with, with, uh, you know, art materials and so on, and always built things outside out of grass and sticks and stones and stuff, whatever was around. And, and um, I guess my mom probably thought I had something because she invited um, the roaming arts, there was a county roaming art teacher. And um, she invited her to come and give me private lessons when I was a kid. So that was just a blast. I love that. So yeah, it started Great. then, <laughs> young. Yeah. yeah, and Karen suggests maybe get a residency in Murano. I Italy. saw that. I love that. <laughs> I think that would be great. That um, would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. It, it, thinking also about, I've lived in three countries in Europe myself. I was Where a piece from well, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Estonia. I lived briefly in Sweden and I also spent a year in Ireland, Galway, Ireland, because my master's thesis in arts management was on the Galway Arts Festival. Oh. So it was like a fantasy kind of research project, That's you know, so very cool. fun. That's and cool. um, yeah, so can you talk a little bit about the difference of being an artist in Europe or elsewhere, um, and, and you were in the South Pacific as well, you said, is there really more, do you feel there's more support for the arts? I know there is in Europe. Oh yeah, yeah, when I lived there, I mean, the plumber would come into my studio and talk to me about what I'm doing. You know, I mean, they, it just was like, everybody was, it was a part of, of the culture, you know, just all the arts, literature, you know, music and visual arts, uh, just all, all, all equal, an mm -hmm. ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see Antonia hey, has- Antonia, has do you wanna talk with us, Antonia? Yeah, I see her question there. And I was just, I was just gonna say, Antonia, so earlier in the slideshow, um, I showed a couple images of, I, I do love getting away from the wall and I've suspended them before um, using, actually working with an artist um, in, I think he's in Baltimore. Um, he did some metal laser cut for me, like a like a, a cloud, I guess you could say, and I hung them from that. Um, I'm totally. I would love to work with somebody who has a different part of their brain working to think how I could suspend the birds. And um, yeah, I definitely would love to have the opportunity to do that. Yeah, suspend them. Great, like curved. I've talked with Zane about this a lot too. That was my cousin back there who was asking a question about the uh, resin. But, um, you know, we've talked about this a lot too, just making these two tubes where the birds can slide onto them and then having all these different shaped tubes around hanging from the ceiling. So it's something I'd like to work on. I'd like to work with somebody who knows what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, like, it does seem like it would require more like architectural integration yes. and an understanding of I don't know if that's engineering Material. or what, but yeah. yeah, yeah, engineering and materials and all of that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm open. I'll do the birds. <laughs> you, that other person, do the the pipes. <laughs> Thanks so much, Antonia. Um, just related to that topic, do you have, um, do you do mobiles? Do you hang, ever hang from the ceiling? Well, yeah, I have. Um, I feel like they're a little vulnerable from hanging just from the ceiling. So I usually have a, some kind of a, I've used screens and frame screens. And then, like I said, those laser cut, I use plexiglass, which is light and um, 
but I, I'm thinking of like a big sweep of birds rather than just a little, you know, unit. I've done, mm -hmm. this, but yeah. Great. And so Marcy has a, the next question. Just that, okay, um, right. Just, I was thinking of um, corning, you know, have you oh, been yeah. there? And the I've been there, it's, it's fabulous, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd love to go there. And yeah, maybe, yeah, you're right. They might have, you know, contacts like all over the place. You're right, yeah. a very good suggestion. I mean, I feel like I have to write it down, but I should be able to remember that. Yeah. <laughs> I, love, I love seeing those, the birds in glass, what you, I mean, so many mediums, they look great. Some look like marble, what you had done, I guess with clay. Yeah, but that's but, what the patina, I can, sometimes people think they're wood, sometimes they think they're iron <laughs> and metal. So that's, that I love, you know, cause it's just lightweight clay, but it can look like so many other things. So play with patinas. But yeah, that's I'm gonna that's that's on my list. <laughs> it's a cool place too. It's amazing what people do with class and yeah, I have no idea. Great, and you both you both do work in encaustic as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, but yeah. do you do encaustic on sculpture? Uh, I've tried it. I didn't like it so much. I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. I could get back to it, but I I I uh, yeah. Or on the clay. I did. I put it as over the top, you know, on one of the birds, and I just didn't like it. Mm -hmm. Not slippery enough or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like to polish it up. I, I don't know. Anyway. Oh, great. Well, I think that um, that brings us to, uh, to a close, unless anyone has any final question or comment for Susan. This is been Thanks wonderful for coming. Thank you so much, all my old friends and roommates and high school yeah. friends and everybody. Thanks and family. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Susan. We look forward to having you back and seeing more of your work all around, all around the town, all around the town. <laughs> okay. <laughs>